you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. On this episode, I'm delighted to welcome Antoinette T.I. Shippers to discuss her haunted history, as chronicled in her ongoing Gatekeeper series of books. Growing up in a very uniquely haunted house was only the beginning of her experiences, and has led her on a path of spiritual awakening and enrichment. But before you can find out about T.I.'s fascinating life so far, don't forget... You can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. Four dollars a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, and more. You can also click the link in the show notes to sign up from there. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms, including some newfangled things. Please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. And don't forget... You can visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for episodes, news, and Mysteries and Monsters merchandise. Thank you as always to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let us welcome T.I. Shippers, and hear how her experiences in the spirit world have led her down the path of her life so far. For many of us who love the paranormal, a childhood experience often leads us towards embracing the other side. My guest today had this amplified beyond the realms of the normal haunted childhood. Antoinette Shippers has been connected to the supernatural since before she could walk. An author, poet, musician and sensitive, T.I.'s books will challenge your understanding of the paranormal. T.I., I am delighted to welcome you to Mysteries and Monsters. How are you? I am wonderful. It's so nice to be here, Paul. I, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I've been very excited since uh, we got this booked in, uh, primarily because uh, your appearance on Jim Harold's campfire a few years ago is one of the spookiest stories I've ever heard in my life, and I know for a lot of people that's one of the most popular campfire stories, but... Um, Compared to the stories that you've covered in your two books so far and some of the interviews I've heard you have previously, T.I., it is a walk in the park, turning up in a, a, <laughs> a haunted roadhouse in comparison with everything else you seem to have gone through, my love. Yeah, just another stop along the way, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> However crazy that sounds. <laughs> when you read your books, it's quite interesting for me looking at your life and the way it started and where you've got to that as I said on the introduction a lot of people have experiences or grow up in haunted houses and they seem quite cheeky or childish you will occasionally come across people who have had frightening encounters T.I. but reading your book it (sighs) There aren't many houses I've ever come across as haunted and as frightening as what seemed to be going on in your childhood home. I agree. And I've encountered many other haunted places throughout my life. And that was so alive with spirit. And it was so overwhelming. I'm not certain if it was because I was tuned into it that it was even more overwhelming, perhaps. But it, um, yeah, that place was haunted like crazy. I've been in a couple other places with the, with even more perhaps disturbing kinds of things. But, um, yeah, the regularity and the just the constant um, spiritual assault almost was, uh, was pretty intense. I think sometimes people can be quite surprised when they hear about your experiences in your early life because obviously you were living in a in a home that had been part of the family for for quite a while I believe that's correct is it one of those situations that we come across sometimes TI where someone will 
be a catalyst for a house that is, to all intents and purposes, until the right people arrive, for whatever reason, it all seems fairly normal. Nothing seems to happen. Was there a history of, of hauntings in the house before your family arrived there? Or was it just one of those, as I say, your arrival as a family was the catalyst to awaken the residents that had slumbered for so long? Well, I, what ha- my family, my ancestors, were the... We, they acquired it from the builders, from the the original owners. Mm. So there was only one other family that lived there before us, and they were the cause of the haunting. They experienced some horrific things and perpetrated some horrific things, and that's what created the haunting. And then what happens, because their human spirits were there, and I think what happens when you have – um a variety of human spheres because my great grandfather was already there, also there. When he died, he just kind of stuck around too. And I, and all of that, plus the anxiety of the people living there, I don't know if it attracts or creates, um, an energy, a force, a thing that becomes like a visceral being. Mm. If it's just energy, if it's just, you know, bundles of, I've seen it before where it's like like this black bundle of tightly woven thread that light can't get through in places where there's a lot of violence or a lot of um, yelling or energy or where there's a haunting and people are always frightened. And I don't know if that attracts something that is already um, a being of itself or if it creates that energy that then appears as a being. I haven't quite figured that out yet. That's my that's something that's I, that's one of my ponderances mm. these days is to try to figure out which comes first. Does that thing come in and create wreak havoc, or does the havoc create that thing? Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely, it's a very interesting point, and it's something I've mulled over in the past before, especially when you deal with poltergeist cases. Mm-hmm. That is it the actual fear that's caused that creates whatever is going on to become stronger and it lasts for for as long as the residents are afraid of it? Or as you say, is it something that's always there and for some reason it just connects with the people who move into the property's frequency? It it is the paranormal chicken and egg, I suspect. Exactly. What what comes first? (laughs) That's right. That's right. The... um... I, and, and I think it might just be like a simultaneous thing mm. that we recognize. You know, I've always said because I've um, – since people know that I can connect with, with spirit, I, I call myself a gatekeeper um, I can – or a spirit medium. And I've had – I don't like advertise this. I don't – people don't pay me for this. But um, when friends, no friends or – People know people who are dealing with some haunting or something in their home, and they'll say, you've got to talk to T.I. She might be able to help you. And I say, I might be able to help you. And and so what I, what I see and I tell people is things become what we feed it. If you are terrified and you are feeding whatever is there, your fear, it grows that part of it. And so uh, one of the things that I tell people before we can actually find out what is going on and help resolve, I don't kick ghosts out of places. That's not, I don't, I don't do that. Um, But we can, there are some issues. Sometimes people just need resolved before they're ready to like, you know, slip more into the background. But so dealing with folks before we can actually get to the bottom of things, I'll tell them if you wake up at night and something is in your room and you're frightened, laugh, laugh out loud and start by faking it and then just laugh harder and harder. And what happens is as you laugh, the energy comes from you in these pulsating bursts and busts up that other energy around you. And when you're laughing, it also disperses your adrenaline in a way that isn't the (gasps) fear kind Mm. of, and then your eyes water and you shake. That's getting rid of adrenaline. When you laugh, you get the adrenaline out the same way, but you don't pull in that, that negative vibe with it. And every single time so far, I'm sure it will someday somebody will say, well, that didn't work. Um, but every single time it was like, oh, my God, that was like magic. 
there was I saw this dark thing and it it was there and you told me to laugh and I started laughing and it just was he was gone. <laughs> you know, it works like a bell. You, people also will ring a silver bell yes. to break up negative energy or run do a singing bowl. You know, all around the world it's creating sound vibration to break up energy. And so if you're someplace and you don't have a bell and you don't have a singing bowl, laugh. And nobody thinks to laugh when you're terrified when you see some <laughs> dark thing start emerging from the floor between your beds. You know, <laughs> but, so, but if you if you can think of, uh, you know, and, and when I tell them, think how absurd that is. <laughs> and it goes, <laughs> it's a crazy concept. But so far, it's worked. Well, yeah, it's prescription for surviving a, a night visitor. <laughs> laugh. <laughs> Excellent. That is, well, to be fair. I've I've heard all kinds of strange alleged cures and uh, defense mechanisms, and I, I, you know, they often say that laughter is the best medicine, and it would clearly for you, Di, it's it works on both planes. It does, it does, <laughs> and then you can't just leave it at that, you know, because that that will only work to dispel it in the moment. But if you have something that keeps, you know, a dark thing that keeps rising up between your at the foot of your bed, that's something that you're going to want to deal with a little. <laughs> definitely definitely i'm i'm very interested because reading your story it it's clear that there's there is some kind of acceleration that begins from you guys moving into this particular property and and taking it on was it a kind of mm-hmm. situation ti that people and your family your, your siblings and your parents and, and the relatives that live next door was it a case of people would just ignore things that were going on until it got to a point that they couldn't ignore it? Or was it just, well, this is odd. And then it went from sort of naught to a hundred in the world of the paranormal in the blink of an eye. Um, so it was kind of both. My grandmother who lived next door, she was my Irish grandmother. And she had a very solid connection with spirit. And she acknowledged that there that there were ghosts there. My mother in, heard footsteps on the stairs of just Pa. He, he, he's and she said, but Pa's been dead for twenty years. And and my grandmother says, well, you know that, and I know that, but I don't think he does. And so she, it was just this open acknowledgement of it. But with the scary hauntings in that house, we didn't know what that was. Mm. And my mother's, although we were all experiencing it, my mother couldn't protect us or save us so she told us together you know our eyes are playing tricks on us and and so we were experiencing it together yeah um but uh and then there was also the way it, it the way it um interacted with my father my mother wasn't wasn't afraid of it so much my mother's family also she was um her ancestors come from New Orleans and they were Creole from New Orleans. They, mm. in the Great Migration, they were Passe Blanche. They left the South, the Jim Crow South, to move north to pass for white. Mm. And so there is a lot of that folk culture, the Creole Southern folk culture that comes from my mother's family. My father, on the other hand, had studied to be a priest and he was terrified of that stuff. Mm. He was he just wanted nothing to do with it. And I think it found him very interesting to to play with. And that's one of the reasons why he was targeted so much. Mm. It is very interesting when you hear of situations like this, where you have a family unit where one particular person seems to be the magnet for the maliciousness for whatever reason. When I've seen people talk about your book especially the first one beyond brick and bone i'm very surprised that people presume that what happened to your father was some kind of demonic possession and yet whenever i've heard you speak about it ti you're quite straightforward and say no it was just a really malicious ghost that was just playing with him reading some of the situations that you as a family found yourself in and what was happening to your poor father on some occasions it, with with no sort of exaggeration is some of the most chilling experiences i've ever read in regards to the paranormal yeah yeah it was um it was very disturbing it was, it was awful um 
I, I, the reason I don't think it was a demonic possession, although he did change in the moment, I think he was just really, really affected by it. Maybe it did, you know, okay, so let me back up a little bit. Over, I, I maintained my recognition and understanding of and kept pursuing trying to figure out more about that whole interdimensional world, you know, between here and there and everywhere. Mm. And what, and I have had in places where connecting with spirit and where they had something to tell their family kind of thing and them trying to, I wasn't moving fast enough for him. So he got kind of behind me and I felt as though he was trying to get inside me. So it was more like a channeling than a possession. And I have a feeling that is what was happening to my father. It was like an involuntary channel instead of a possession because it was not a demon. There was no, there were no demons in that place. These were, um, as there was that energy created by the fear and stuff, that dark thing that when the temperature in the room would go up in terms of anxiety, I could feel this thing pressing down. Um, and as soon as that thing lifted up, the anxiety would disperse. But I'm not sure if that was an energy, but I, I think what people call demons, um, you know, because when you say demon, it's like something that is evil mm. and should be smitten or cast away or banished. And I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of times what people think are demons are maybe an interdimensional thing that um, that instead of being malicious toward us, doesn't really care, you know, like to a mosquito. I'm I, I'm a demon yes. because if a mosquito comes on my arm, it's like, boop, I'm in its space. So I think that happens and that gets misinterpreted. Are there evil things out there? Are there malicious things out there? Absolutely. We don't get to just be anywhere we want. And if we start moving in and getting into their stuff, well, then we get these, you know, weird things happen to people. <laughs> But, um, yeah, but, but my dad, it was not, it was not a demon. I think he was channeling, um, the ghost of Charles mm. because in the, I, I started writing the book, um, because those are the family ghost stories and I was the teller of them and my children loved them and other folks. And they said, you should write those stories down. And so I originally wrote them as just short stories. So it was going to be just a collection of short ghost stories from, you know, the, the Pensacola house, not Pensacola, Florida, but the street from the Chicago house. And then I shared them and people loved the stories. And then I shared them with my, was, um, always tells the truth. And she said, you know, these are great. I love these stories. You're, you write them well. Um, but this should not be the story of the house. This is your origin story. So put yourself there. Instead of telling the ghost story, show what was happening and tell and show your childhood and what was happening around it. Well, I was like, oh, crap, because now I have to go back and relive <laughs> all this <laughs> traumatic stuff that had happened to me. And I'm like, oh, I left that I left that behind about 40 years ago or whatever. <laughs> and um, so I started writing and. The memories, it was so vivid. I mean, it just, it, I was right there. And I think that's kind of, it's a kind of PTSD. And that's what it does. It was like flashbacks where it was so clear and re-experiencing it, re-experiencing how everything felt, which made it very possible to write it the way that I did. Because it was almost like experiencing it as I wrote it, re-experiencing it anyway. And then as I was getting toward the end, I was waking up in the middle of the night with ghosts in my room and I, my sleeping space, I don't let spirits in, you know, when I go in places, sometimes it's like, Oh, Hey, hi, you know, like, Hey, I, Hey, wait over here, over here. But I put up, you know, a protection around my room. I need to sleep. And I was waking up and there were, there was the man closet. There were the, them away. I would use all of my banishing techniques and push them back and, you know, Nope, get out, get out. And then it would happen the next night and the next night. And finally, I woke up and I'm like, what am I afraid of? Any other time I have encountered a persistent spirit like this, I ask, what can I do to help? Mm. You know, what do you want 
What, how can I help you? Can I help you? And so I did that to these ghosts. And I, but I said, but not tonight. I'll sleep. And when I sit down to my computer tomorrow, I will come and tell me your story. And when, when a ghost or a spirit tells me their story, they don't tell it from the beginning to end. It's like, um, it all comes in one whole memory and it's, it feels like one of my memories, but it feels different. It's like if you remember an event that you experienced, you don't remember it by starting at the beginning of it. You remember the wholeness of it. Hmm. And that's how these spirits did the story. And I started writing like, um, like six hours a day nonstop. And I would start by putting it in third person. And just telling, you know, writing what was coming to me. And it switched to first person. I had to go back after sitting for a couple hours and writing, you know, pages and pages. I had to go back and, and make the tense or, you know, make the um, in, in all in, in third person, you know, talking about he or she instead of I, 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 I to get rid of the I. <laughs> and, um, and I was writing about places. And Greek names for things and places in Greece, places in Chicago from the 1870s, um, experiencing the, the Chicago fire, um, all this stuff that I did not know, street names, um, name of a restaurant in Chicago. And I'm typing all this. And at that time, I was um, I'd been in accidents. So it was set up in in my living room with the chair with cushions and. My husband would walk in and I'd be just furiously writing and he would just turn around and, and leave because the energy of the room was, it was all just coming out. <laughs> and when I would take a break, I would say, okay, would you just Google this name and this date? And he said, oh, and it was, and it was, and it was accurate. And all the stuff that I was writing was accurate. Um, I would have had amounts of research to find those dates and those places and those things that these spirits were sharing with me. And so for me, that was just an affirmation to keep going. Hmm. And I did. And I would, I would be exhausted at the end of the night and have to do, you know, do my meditation to refill myself with my own energy again. Yeah. And I ended up the first half of the book. I did several versions. I had notes. I had an outline. Um, I put it in, order you know i moved stuff around i was it was very both left brain right brain in the first part mm. part two i wrote in about three weeks just flat out wow it just was there and um and then they had their story out and then once it was finished um the 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 ghost of one of the main ghosts the one who was the slinky lady who was the who I thought was just a residual mm. was actually very conscious. And she said, I've been waiting to be able to tell you the story. You know, I knew you would be able to hear me when you were a child, but I couldn't tell you then she didn't want to burden me with what had happened mm. and waited until I was able to tell it. And after that, I just felt them gone. I felt their presence no longer there. It was uh, it was such a a, a powerful experience. Um, yeah, that was that was really something. Yeah, as, I mean, as you 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 mentioned earlier, Di, one of the things that can often happen when people write a book about their experiences, regardless of the the type of field it can be, in, some people find it quite cathartic, and they allows them to deal with a lot of sort of unresolved trauma or situations that perhaps they've pushed away for a long period of time but as you said i would imagine it, it can work both ways that especially with your experience of how you've become to deal with the the supernatural and the spiritual entities around you and how you've sort of progressed in your understanding of the of the circumstances and what's gone on was this difficult as you were saying about the first portion of the book putting yourself back in that going through these because uh, you know as we touched on earlier on and you've mentioned mentioned her the, the slinky lady the incident with your father which is in the chapter entitled serpent is 
shocking from from top to bottom. I can only imagine what that would be like to witness as an adult, as your mother and your uncle dealt with. I cannot comprehend what that must have been like for you and your siblings to have witnessed that because it, the description of it, and and the movements and the the voices and 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 everything really made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up to you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, that's something that, um, that, that was a, that was a horrific thing to witness as a child. It was, it, especially, you know, your father is your protector. And when your father can't protect himself, where does that leave you? So it was, but my mother was always incredibly strong and, and, and there was a lot of denial. We just went on to the next thing. You know, we just kept moving forward and kept living because we had to. You know, um, children who experience war do the same thing. I know this isn't like war, but mm-hmm. when you're in this constant state of, um, of stress and, um, anxiety, uh, it, it really affects just how you go about what you're doing. We also did get, have lots of respites because when we weren't in the house, everything was lovely. Mm. And, um, but when we go home, (laughs) you know, it it was like, boom, it was back. (laughs) And then my father's response to it, when he would drink with this, my, my uncle Jack, you know, he, when he trying to get him back, would give him large glasses of whiskey. Hmm. Um, and, what would happen is by drinking a terrifying figure, you know, and that's the thing is for me, I also watched him heal from that and all of us heal from that. And when we, after we left the house by talking about it and talking about our experiences and acknowledging it, we were all able to be okay with it. Mm. And, you know, almost everybody witnesses something terrible in their life. Mm. And if you just, if you let it consume you, then you're consumed by it. Yeah. Or you can look at it. You could say, wow, that happened. And what do we do next? You know, the, what the past is only good to us for what we learn from it, learn from it and how we can use it as we move forward. And that was the biggest lesson growing up in that place. Mm-hmm. Was it a situation that your your siblings were also able to see some of the, the spirits that in, inhabited the property, the eye? Yes, yes. So I've heard you mention this previously, that, and, and I completely agree with you, there's cert, there seems to be a certain point where you hit a certain age, such as your teenage years, where even if you've had all these experiences and you are aware of it and you see things, as you hit your teenage years, you kind of leave it all behind as you grow and you in other interests kind of pull your attention and take you away from it. Do you think that the fact that you had such a troubled teenage era where you had some medical challenges in your teenage years, do you think that allowed you to focus on continuing to be connected and experiencing the supernatural, whereas perhaps your siblings were able to to go off and do things, T.I., that it, not that it forced you to, to, to face up to it, but it basically gave you a way of moving forwards and being positive through that extremely challenging period of your life. Yes, and it's like it, it, it forced me, but it was also an opportunity for me. Um, I've really, I've seen that and I watched my siblings who were very sensitive, um, just kind of, it was no longer something that they needed to pay attention to. So they didn't pay attention to it. And, um, I still, we all, we can all still tell if we go into a haunted place, my sisters and I especially will like give, give each other the side eye, you know, but, but it's not like in their daily lives. Um, but for me, it's right at that age. It's right when you're starting to mature, right at puberty air, kind of, that I think we just get too busy and we shift. Our brain changes. Oh, the human brain changes so much in young adolescence. And that part of the brain that is perceiving all that other world 
just stops paying attention to that and focuses solely on the the corporeal, you know, the what you could touch and taste and smell, although some of it you could touch and taste and smell. And I was faced with a prognosis that I was not going to have a long life and that through it I was going to be experiencing greater and greater disability. Mm. And I was already experiencing high levels of pain and on, you know, not able to participate as a normal teenager. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm going to just try to figure out the nature of things outside of the physical. Like what happens when our bodies are no longer here? How do I, how do I, you know, there's more than just this that is hurting me. And so I just kept, um, pursuing that. And in my own self, you know, in my own body, I focused on learning more about my energetic self, my, my soul self or spirit self and worked on that. And I learned how to leave my physical body and go and move freely through space when my physical body was not able to do that. And so I just kept that up through that time. And it was, it, it helped me. And also I, I was, studied and I, I was, I was so interested. I studied, you know, global cultures and their, their pantheon of gods and mythologies and, and cosmologies. And what do people, friends, friends who were worried about getting a pimple on their face for a Friday night date. I wasn't dating on Friday nights. I was thinking about, um, you know, how do, how do the, you know, Tibetan Buddhists deal with death. You know, yes. <laughs> this was this to me was what I was was concerned. I was studying ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and um, reading the Book of the Dead. It, it made me a very weird child. But <laughs> I guess that's what led to me being a very weird adult. <laughs> so, so, but it's <laughs> and yeah, it was it was I, when I found out. So in my later thirties. They told me I had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Mm. And so all of my treatments, and once you get a diagnosis, everything happens within that diagnosis, all the treatments, all of, you know, your whole planning, everything is based on that. Well, I never felt like that was right. I never felt like, I never, well, I did in the beginning, and I you know, went through all the stages of grief and, and yeah. depression about it. And then I was like, wait a minute. I'm going to just live every minute. So I, I get to be the grasshopper. I don't have to be the ant and the grasshopper and ant kind of thing. And just I'm a very positive thinking person. So I'm always trying to see the good in whatever happens. And um, and then in my late 30s, um, I found out I was watching a television program, um, a science program, and they were talking about this new thing that they found called Lyme disease mm. and I was in Michigan my mother was in Chicago and a few minutes after the program ended she called me up she said I just watched this thing and it was from a tick bite and where I am at the time and I first got sick right after we went home from up north here so that's when I started to learn about Lyme disease and got all this research put together went to my doctor and said, what do you know about Lyme disease? He said, that mu not much. I gave him a stack of papers I'd copied from my microfiche at the library and said, <laughs> read this and give me a call. And he did. I was, I was, his kids were in my class. I was his kid's teacher. Mm. And um, he said, homework? And I said, yeah, please. Um, and it turned out that's it was Lyme disease. So I was able to be treated. And it was, and it stopped the progression of it. It didn't stop. I'm still, I still have physical disabilities because it, I have that autoimmune stuff still, mm. but it's, it didn't just keep getting worse and worse and worse. I went from, I've been in and out of wheelchairs and walking with two canes, a walker, and, um, and now I use a cane when I'm out on unstable ground. Otherwise I, I just can flit here and there and I can walk on a treadmill for miles, you know? And so it was like the miracle, but it was, you know, it was a scientific discovery, which are the true miracles and, um, getting treated and, and it was life changing. And so then at that point, without having to deal with that intense pain, I started this new awakening that where all of these things I had learned, 
all of my experiences in other worlds, in other places with things that come through here and there, just all seem to coalesce in this big picture. And that's, that's where I am now. And I, I feel like I'm just walking through this world really with a, a view of an understanding and awareness of how much more is here and around us than any of us experience on a day-to-day basis and than most of us ever experience. And I feel like that is such a remarkable gift to me. It's, uh, um, it's just, I'm so grateful for it. When after I was uh, correctly diagnosed and treated, I remember someone saying, aren't you mad that all these years that they'd have found this all these years ago, you wouldn't do this or do that? And I said, no, actually, no, even at all, not even at all. Because once you experience the world from sitting in a wheelchair, you know what that is like for others in a wheelchair. And when I'm standing up and there's someone in a wheelchair, I know that experience and I can empathize with that and I can have compassion for more people dealing with more things. And my compassion is how I approach everything in the world for humans, for non-humans, for living humans, for dead humans, for whatever. I just feel great compassion for all of us who share this existence in this life or these lives. Yeah. I think it's, it's remarkable really, because often when you're faced with such a, a consistent challenge to your physical well-being often the damage is is also mental as well ti because you you're having to deal with these prognoses you're being told that you've got life-changing ailments nothing will ever be the same again sometimes it must have been extremely difficult to to even look forward to the following day and i think anybody that's been through anything like that it is remarkable that if you are able to focus your attention or your energies into something that keeps you motivated, as you say, even if it's under, trying to understand hieroglyphics and reading about legends and myths and monsters from around the world, as long as you've got something that's a bit of fire in your belly, it makes sure that even when you're racked with pain and you don't know what tomorrow may even bring, you've got a reason to wake up and put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forwards in some manner or other. And I suppose as well with your philosophy on life and your outlook, it could be kind of, was this always meant to be? Was this the plan? Because I've I've spoken to other people and certain traumatic incidents have occurred or, or they've had life-changing events that have pushed them into a path that for whatever reason, and I consider myself someone like that as well, T.I., that there comes a point in your life when something happens and you have to change or it changes things for you. And if you don't run with it, then you will be you will fall by the wayside. Yeah. So those who survive rise to that challenge and find that thing that keeps the fire in the belly. But I'm going to flip that instead of it being a plan. Um, I don't think because I've seen terrible things happen to people and it's like, you know, we're not given anything we can't handle. Well, that's a lie. Yeah. Um, and bad things or whatever happens in our life, it doesn't happen to us for a reason. What we do is things happen to us and then we find reason and we use that to move forward. So it, it's instead of feeling helpless, and I think this has helped me to overcome all this, instead of feeling helpless, like, oh, now this, what, poor me, you know, now I have to deal with this. It was like, okay, here is this challenge. What can I, how can I turn this into something remarkable or beautiful or useful to me, even just to me? Um, And that is just how I, how I did it. So I never felt like somebody planned for me to have all these experiences from my early childhood. Although Kara from the ghost from my childhood said she recognized me and she knew that one day I would be able to, to hear her story. And she was grateful that I did in in the end. Um, But uh, so did she just recognize where I was and just stick around and, and wait um, while all the things in my life happened to get me through? Or were there others that she felt the same way about, who then 
just lost track of it and she could no longer connect with. Mm. I, you know, that's, that's, that's real. That's a, um, a conundrum, you know, that's a, uh, but I, I don't think that somebody had a plan or something had a plan. I feel like I just have a wonderful life. I have, um, beautiful friends and I have lovely experiences. And, um, my, my daughters said to me, Someone said, it's amazing that you could do this despite everything that's happened to you in your life. And and her, she pipes up and she says, it's not despite what happened. It's because of. Mm -hmm. It's because of what happened. Because the way that you rise to each challenge turns you into the person you are. Very true. Very true. And I think it is. It is often, as you said, about flipping the the presumption of, of what is meant to be. I think it is it's often people tend to think about what could have been rather than what can be. And I think that alone is often as delimitating for people as any sort of trauma or, or injury or, or illness that people go through is that they think about what they've lost rather than what they may gain in a different way. And I think when people are able to, to accept that and realise it, they would often probably succeed in areas far more than they could ever have imagined if if life had been straight down the line with no sort of complications being thrown at you on any level really ti right yeah absolutely absolutely and yeah you know, i was lucky to have i had really good solid mentors around me and i also had i believe i i i have ancestors who have been with me and helped me along that have were already um, already passed, but are, have con are connected with me. I think we all do, but I was very aware of them. But my grandmother, um, she suffered from rheumatoid arthritis. So when they told me I had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, that was scary because she was she was toward the end, and she gave me the best advice I ever received. Um, just start making lists of new things you're doing that you might not have been doing while you were doing the other things that you no longer can do. And it was like, it was flipping the, it was flipping the paradigm. Mm. You know, how you look at things is everything. And I would not be playing music had I not done this. I would not be a musician. I would not be a poet. Mm. I would not be a writer probably. Um, because I, I, all these things that I was new things that I tried that I would have been too busy being a normal kid playing baseball. Mm -hmm. I gave me this rich life that I have now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, at what point did you begin to move from from your own personal experiences in the family home to sort of developing your sensitivity to other aspects of the paranormal? Was it the fact that you'd been through this and you'd had these relationships with the spirits in, in the family home, was it that that gave you that thirst to think, well, if I can see them and I can still see them, then this isn't only fixed at this particular property, it can go wherever I go. Was it something that you took time as you were on about reading during your recuperation in your teenage years? Was it sort of something that you would learn about things or you would look at other techniques or you would read people's work or, or you would follow investigators to see how they had developed their skills to hone them to make you better and, and, and more receptive to to the voices that others couldn't hear so as a as a as a young person i did not it was you know this was this was the 70s and there wasn't a lot of that out there and um i just i just experienced it and was learning from my own experiences and just paying attention to things um, beyond just the surface. But then, uh, it's only recently, um, that I have realized that there are others that, that do this, that feel this, that see this, and that are very, um, learned and well versed and, and that there is research and stuff out there about it. And, uh, I find it fascinating, but, um, yeah, I'm not like a scholar of of the paranormal or the the amorphous or whatever it is the mm. anomalous um i'm not i don't study that stuff or other people's techniques um 
I find it interesting. Like I meet other people. There's a, a these two sisters, um, Jill and Jennifer, from a podcast called Common Mystics, mm-hmm. and um, they I met them through a mutual friend, and it was really fun interacting with each, you know, talking to each other and talking about how much the same what we do is and how different, you know, each of our different techniques and, and that stuff. And so that now that I'm, it's out, I'm out there more publicly, the books really opened that up. Um, when I, once I put it into print and people started reading, others reached out to me. And so fu- now I'm feel like I'm growing a community and learn to learn from and as well as to share and learn that, that mutual exchange. And then, um, doing the doing the podcast and and the i think the what has brought probably the most um people with questions and and asking about how i do things and then me being able to ask ask them the same was really during the pandemic when i did the stories on facebook i did a whole bunch of series of live ghost stories on facebook on sunday nights just to fill the time because we couldn't be together and Mm-hmm. You know, we would always tell stories when we were together and, uh, and that broadened my, the, the community of people that I can now interact with. And, uh, but I've never like read about how people do stuff. Like I haven't studied how other people leave their body and do, I know I've read and I know that it's, that it's called astral traveling. I always just called it spirit travel. Mm. Um, but, uh, so bits and pieces are coming too, but I never really focused on that. And as a, as a teenager, that was not, I was just doing it. I was just experiencing it. Um, I was reading about other things. Yeah. Yeah. I was never directed toward that. I'm always interested when I hear people such as yourself, T.I., when they talk about this modern perception about bumping spirits out of properties, regardless as though uh, it, it it's always a problem. And I'm, I'm a, I'm very perplexed how these days when we look at any sort of investigations that are shown on television or, or whatever, everything has to be cleansed. And yet in my personal oh. experience and the people I've spoken to over the years and the people, the experiences we've had, we, we've we been quite fond of our resident ghosts. And I know people who love having a ghost. It's a bit, sometimes it keeps you on, the, on your tiptoes and on the edge of your seat occasionally. But a lot of people have a lot of, affection for their supernatural lodgers um do you think this is do you think this is this modern interpretation that um all ghosts are problems and have to be removed regardless whereas my personal experience and, and what i've read the vast majority of things until the modern era hauntings seem to be quite pleasant that it seems to have the last 30 years there seems to be this sort of pr i don't know who's in charge of the of, of ghost pr but they need to sort it out because uh, it's not what it, how it used to be. But it makes for good television. Well, it's a matter of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I I, it breaks my heart to see that stuff and to have people think that. Well, um, I. The thing is, is you don't. We don't have the power to cleanse a place. People, you know, when they're like sage. Well, what sage does is like smoking a beehive. It calms things down. You don't send something packing with sage. It just, and people say, oh, I saged, and then it just got worse. Well, you know, while you're smoking the, a place, you know, or just smudging, um, it, it's, like I said, smoking a beehive. It, it just settles the energy down, but it get rid of it. It comes from that. I think it's like humans being colonial, you know, that we believe that this is, you can't be here. This is my space. Well, According to who, <laughs> you know, um, we share this place, whether you like it or not, with way more things than you could see when you're sitting there in your chair. There are spiders in your room that you do not see right now. <laughs> we are sharing our space with these things. And instead of trying to, you know, spray chemicals throughout the house to get rid of all the, the spiders that are there, put them in a little cup and move them where they're not going to bite you. Or, or, you know, work things out. Um, so when I'm, when somebody wants me to come and clear their home, mostly it's someone who has recently passed and really needs 
that's why I say I'm a spirit medium. So I'm not working for the people. It's the spirits themselves that are like, I have this thing that I could really use some help with kind of thing. Mm. Um, but when I go to somebody who is experiencing a haunting or a, um, the, either a human haunting or an elemental haunting, cause that happens too. Um, I'm not going to get rid of that. So my job is to, I see it as to help the people and what whoever else they're sharing the place with come to an agreement of how they're going to coexist. And, you know, the, the folks that then say that I move and, and something else is in my new house. It's like it's following me. I'm a haunted person. Well, no, you've just been made aware of what is there everywhere. Everyone always is. Mm. And so when you go to the next place, you're aware of what's there. So instead of freaking out and trying to have an exorcism or whatever, how about we just learn how to get along, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's what human beings have done forever. They set up a little fairy altar for the house fairies. They, they put out, um, they put out the pictures and, and the stories of their dead ancestors in, in Mexican culture. They, every other culture that is not trying to colonize and own everything gets along with the other spirits. In Thailand, you know, the little spirit houses right outside your house. Mm -hmm. So they're there instead of in your house. Um, setting up the little altar in Japanese. Every other culture just acknowledges that we are not alone and goes at it with grace and a little, um, a little less arrogance and uh, aggression. And I think that's part of this whole new ghost hunting. When I hear ghost hunting, I I I, I want to throw up, relive their trauma for our entertainment. Seriously, there is something wrong with that. Yeah, yeah it's my soapbox. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I often find it perplexing as well that um, yeah, I've, I've, I've spoken to people who have who have lived through some, some very harrowing hauntings or whatever and 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 such like, and I'm always mystified a lot of the times where people just turn up and go right yeah this is terrible this is a really bad haunting it's it's the worst and it's 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 a terrible thing and 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 then they just go and leave these people they don't seem to actually help them ti they just right. basically seem to come in and go yeah this is this is this is terrifying i don't know how people can live with this and then they go right how's that right. helping anybody and because <laughs> it isn't and not themselves either but I think it's, you know, I, I, I don't think people really know that instead of saying, get out, get out, say, well, well here's, here's a very simple example. Um, a friend whose father had passed where he was like coming to her and she was terrified of him. And she was like, oh, I'm, a, I'm afraid I don't want to, I don't want to see him. He's not supposed to be here. He's dead. And I said, how about next time just say, Hi, I love you, Dad. That's all. Mm -hmm. And then, and she did. And then she felt like he responded. She could feel his love. And then she was no longer afraid. Where someone else would be like, oh, he's stuck. It's a stuck ghost. We have to do something to help him go into the light. How arrogant. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we, we help people. The only way we can help living people is by giving them more information. Mm. Same thing with the dead. Yeah. We give them the more information. We hear what they need and we offer them compassion. And if there's something like this one spirit that didn't want his heirloom ring sold away, he wanted it to go to his daughter. And once that was clear, it was like, okay, we got that. Take care of that. And it's like, okay, cool. Now everything's good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of going there with, you know, I was, um, this other family had, and this is my, um, this will be the, it'll be the, it's uh, the fifth book is what I'm working on now. The fourth is finished, but we're waiting to go to the publisher, but is about a family that had a lot of really scary things. And there was a, a really dark thing in the property all around. So, I mean, I'm often interested as well, because we always look at it from the perception of the people rather than the, the ghosts. And as you touched on there and the couple of examples that you've just given us, T.I., I'm often perplexed that people don't look at it from the, the side of the, the ghost more, as you say, because 
surely if we are to believe that some of these spirits are conscious and are there because they want to be there why do we not expect them to feel love or loss or grief and not be able to comprehend the fact that they've passed on from from the mortal plane that they want to be near their family they want to be near their loved ones because even for them love transcends death and love does transcend death that is the one thing that lasts that i have experienced so more times than i could than i can tell in a lifetime mm. and that is so true but we don't see that we see it as you're not supposed to be here and i think it's because we have set up this um this kind of dogmatic expectation that when you die, you either go one way or you go the other way. And once again, this is my house. This is my existence, my life. If you are not in, if you are not part of my living life right now, you don't belong here. And it's just arrogant. And when you, when you look at it, when you look at spirit as having feelings and being able to have compassion for even, even something that may have done bad things in their life or, or has terrible guilt. Most of the, the ghosts that are there that have more uncomfortable hauntings have incredible remorse and are just, they're afraid to let go because they're stuck in this notion that you're going to go either up or down. Mm. You know, it's a, it's a black or white, either or. And that's, that's not how it is. And if we just have compassion for all things, this whole world would be such a better place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and so just recognizing that it is not all, we, all that exists is not carbon based, you know, and we ourselves exist, not just in our bodies. We, we exist, even if you don't believe in spirit travel or in, you know, being able to separate body and spirit. Everyone has a rich imaginative life. We all have a dreamscape mm -hmm. that is beyond what we, you know, cooking dinner or washing dishes. And yet we don't think that there could be other things that are existing in, in that place. What a beautiful world it is when you can open your eyes and see how rich the possibilities are when you realize just how much surrounds us how much and not there for us but there for us to learn from and to see and to just be a part of hmm. Hmm. i think as well it, it all also helps us for people to get a better understanding of of what's going on as well because as you say as, as anything strange happens a lot of people automatically re react in fear or they become scared ti yeah. and yet i think as as you've mentioned, once you're able to sort of explain who these people are, why they're there, that they're just quite... I think this is one of the other aspects, as you were saying about this is my space. I, I Once again, I, I'm often perplexed that, as, as you were saying about the family residence and, and obviously what you dealt with growing up, I would imagine it would have been as surprising for the ghosts that they'd got this family arrive as it is for the for the humans and it, once again we just presume that these floating apparitions are just sort of hanging around as residual hauntings and yet there are thousands and thousands and thousands of reports from all across the world that shows that there are a myriad of, of different types of hauntings and quite a lot of them are very aware that they're not of this earth anymore right Right. And, and so, and like you say, all over the world. So how, why do we just keep, I, I can't understand. It just blows my mind that an enormous part of the human existence and human understanding throughout time has been an awareness of an experience of an affinity with things that are not the the unseen the other world the, uh, and yet somebody just says well i don't believe that it's 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 
it's mind boggling that, you know, well, show me the proof. Um, you know, when I tell you I feel sad, do I have to show you the proof? Or can you just say, yeah, I can feel that you're sad. You know what I mean? Mm. Yes, yeah. I, I suppose as well. It's it's one of those things I'm I've, I've spoken spoken with people before and it's it's very I find it wonderfully refreshing when I speak with people such as yourself who have such a positive outlook in regards to the hauntings and and the way that side of our existence seems to work and as you refer to there when you were talking about other cultures around the world Ti you only have to look at what happened after the tsunami in japan in 2011 and these stories about people or spirits trying to come home or taking taxi rides and the acceptance in that particular area that yes yeah. this was happening it's fine we need to help these people and they kept calling them people which i also found refreshing as well people weren't poo-pooed they weren't told they were silly or whatever they were just allowed to find support either from from their 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 local church or their different religions and and, and perhaps a lot of uh, the shintos were, were were dealing with with a lot of people as well as some of the christian churches that are based in japan and i found that a really eye-opening series of of experiences that were being reported from people from all walks of life who were dealing with a situation that they may not have had first-hand experience of losing a loved one or a close friend or something or a colleague but they were still having to deal with some of the ramifications of these lost spirits trying to get home right trying to figure out what the heck happened what where am i you know yeah. a, a quick traumatic death um will do that it's like wait what's going on you know and to have a mass incident like that and then the experience in the accounts i, I how yeah and it, i i think it it was um my question is how is that not evidential mm. you know how is that not evidence of the existence of this and you know, calling it mass hysteria or the people who were experienced it were also traumatized and so it was you know i, I actually heard somebody say it well they were doing this it was in their own subconscious to try to work out the loss of their own loved ones well that is such bull crap you know when you have an entire community and culture that accepts it and then these things are happening that to me is evidence that it's happening mm. you know so. absolutely and i would suggest that any culture on this planet that can deal with the ramifications of loss of life through earthquakes and tsunamis is is going to be the japanese are going to probably be the best people able to deal with that because it is a part of their everyday lives sadly that's right that's right and so we learn how to do that Mm. And we look, yeah, yeah. I mean, they always have a very positive outlook there in regards to ancestors, and it, you know, especially over the sort of Eastern Asian continent, Ti. There's a lot of cultures and countries over there that have a real sort of connection with their ancestors, um, go that goes back generations. That they still speak to them as if they are there, or they may set a place at the table on certain days of the year or birthdays and things because they want them, even though they have passed on from the from the physical form a lot of cultures out there still believe that they are around there and therefore why should they not be involved in the celebrations of their their relatives which i find a really i, I just find it a very lovely way of of dealing with with hauntings and ghosts in a in a really positive manner i agree i i love that and they're not you know these are people who are not freaking out and going and throwing holy water all over the place. <laughs> These are people who were like, yes, we're here and we're good together because this is because it is just part of life. We come from our ancestors and and we will leave and our progeny will continue. And it's just part of the whole the whole big picture. You know, and if, if we just lighten up about it and not freak out so much. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, as you mentioned, you've you've got two volumes so far of your Gatekeeper series, and you've also published a wonderful book of poetry with a, a, a supernatural slant. So your third volume of the Gatekeeper series is, is due out later this year, I believe, T.I. So 
Is that focusing on a particular period of your life following the, your second book, uh, A Liminal Life? Because obviously it's it's clearly becoming a, a series of, of sections in your life where you're able to to compartmentalize these aspects of, of particular periods and write your book about that particular chunk, even though you may go backwards and forwards to, to connecting things. So is the third one leading on from, from that as you, you continue to develop? Well, it is in a way, but where I'm going after liminal life is as I evolve as a gatekeeper, as I learn more, my approach to hauntings or to um, troubled spirits has evolved and changed. So the third book is a, a particular place, a particular haunting over time. And what I discovered by learning to interact in what I, my newly, I believe that that was a time that I actually moved instead of experiencing things coming in from a, one dimension, mm -hmm. I believe I moved into a different dimension. Mm -hmm. And so the, the third book is dealing with interdimensional things in this one place with an awareness that there are things that are not ghosts that can be considered quote unquote hauntings. And so that the, the name of that book is going to be grace in the cabin and it's dealing with human ghosts and also interacting with an elemental that was part of the whole big picture. And so that's about that one so it's my my spiritual evolution, but it's not just chronological. Now I'm this age kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the next one that I'm writing right now is um, deals with yet another place where I'm at, at a at a different level in dealing where I've learned more. And now I'm able to approach a completely different thing in a whole new level. Um, so it's my, it's more or less my spiritual evolution or I don't know if it's spiritual or my, my ability to interact evolution. So it's not just the next chronology. So this won't just be, you know, writing a, a, a memoir until I finally kick it, you know. <laughs> Oh, and when's the uh, when's the new one due out? Well, it won't be till next year because this um, it'll be like for for my my publisher is a very small publishing house, and um, so putting a year between the books is probably the easiest for marketing and mm. for all the work that goes into that they do that the publisher himself does. You know, I write it and then they do yeah. they do all the heavy lifting of <laughs> yes. um, everything, and so it probably won't be till next year, but. Uh, I'll keep you abreast of when it is coming. Lovely. Send well, you a copy. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Well, I look forward to its release because I would love an opportunity to speak with you again about the contents of what you will be releasing, if that fits into your schedule whenever that comes around. Absolutely. That'd be lovely. Thank you. Well, listen, thank you. Um, we've, we've both done this interview in the greatest of humour because I think we've had a few gremlins in the works, but we've managed to get here. T.I. <laughs> we have. We have. <laughs> um, no road is smooth that is worth taking. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. If it's not a challenge, it's not worth doing, in my opinion. So <laughs> where can everybody find you online, get hold of your wonderful books and keep up to date with everything else you've got coming down the line? Thanks. Well, well my books are available on Amazon, um, but you can also go to your brick and mortar bookstore and just ask for the title and the author um the two gatekeeper books are beyond brick and bone and that's by antoinette shippers that's my birth name and then the second book is a liminal life and that's by antoinette parentheses ti shippers and they're both parkhurst brothers publishers so if you just ask your bookstore to order it i prefer you do that because um you may not get it the next day in the mail but you're supporting your local bookstore. So hmm. please do that first. Um, second, you can also follow me. I have a YouTube channel. When, when I did the Facebook live stories, I recorded them all and then I put them up on YouTube because there were people that wanted to hear them that weren't on Facebook. So I have a YouTube channel with, I think it's got like 55 or some stories there. And it's me telling stories of either my personal experiences or friends who we've experienced things together, friends or family. Um, and that is the YouTube channel is Spooky Ms. M-S-T-I, T-I-Y-I. 
And if you subscribe, I'm getting ready to record another one. So one should be coming out in a week or so. And you can look at all the others, too. So Fabulous. I also have a website, a Spooky Miss TI website that I'm trying to keep abreast of. But I'm an old <laughs> person, so I'm not real good at that. My daughter helps me with that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with so, that. Honesty is always the best policy, TI. Honesty is always the best policy. Well, I will always put links to everything in the show notes so everybody can help you track your work down and keep up to date and follow you and uh, have a few spooky stories to chill them and, uh, on a dark night as we, uh, as the nights begin to grow ever slightly darker as we barrel on towards winter. But I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Your books are fascinating and you've lived such an interesting life that while some aspects of, of the stories that you've shared with us have um, sent a shiver down my spine, I'm glad to be able to speak with you in the good humour and amusement that you can look back on some of these incidents. And thank you again for your wonderful time today. You're so kind. Thank you so much. And you be well.